welcome you all and thank you for sharing your uh, Wednesday afternoon with us. Um, and uh, I would re really like to thank the, the directors of the Pro section, Avil Pitoresco, Chiara Battisti, and Carmela Pierini, for organizing this, uh, this really interesting series, and uh, of course for inviting me to, to, to chair this session. Um, and the session on uh, poetry, voice, and storytelling in the clinic is going to be uh, delivered by uh, Roselle, Rosella Riccobono. Uh, Rosella is an independent retired scholar from the University of St. Andrews. Uh, she has taught and researched in Italian studies since 1991, firstly at the University of Edinburgh, then at the Victoria the University of Wellington in New Zealand, and finally at the University of St. Andrews. Our main, our main areas of interest are Italian poetry and cinema, and she's written on the poetry of Eugenio Montaldi and Serassi Favisi, and on the cinema of Nanini Moretti and Mario Montaigne. Uh, lately, her research interests have shifted to the use of poetry therapy for the support of permanent terminal cancer patients in the hospice institution, and she has co-written an article on the value of poetry therapy for, for people in palliative and end-of-life care. And this was published in the journal uh, Progress in Palliative Care 2020. She's also a poet, and her poetry has been published in uh, a variety of volumes, from, uh, including Real Life Bird uh, Song uh, the, by the Wate what, what Ete Press in Wellington. And her first uh, poetry collection, States of Mind and Love, was published by Edizioni Joker Transfer Transference in 2008. Um, she was invited to read at the first Wellington International Poetry Festival in 2003, and her text appeared in the anthology of Proceedings, uh, later published by The Headworks in 2004. And, uh, with this, I will hand you over to Ro uh, Rosella. Over okay. to you, Rosella. Thank you very much. Thank ah. you, Cecilia. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask everybody if they can see me mm -hmm. while I'm speaking, uh, because I want to do the recording, yeah? And so I would like the, um, the PowerPoint to appear next uh, to me. So when we publish it, um, we don't have problems of asking for permission for you to, to appear in the... In the um, so... Let's see if I will try and do it this way, maybe. Mm. Yeah, you all appear. <laughs> so if by any chance you want to uh, not appear in the um, recording, which will go public, um, you can, you know, it's up to you to, you know, keep the camera on or keep it off, it's up to you, okay? But you know that uh, it will be published because I can't delete you from, <laughs> unfortunately, I can only see, I can only see when it's just the speaker, I can only see Cecilia. So, okay, we'll do it this way then. We'll do it this way, like this. Okay. Right. Okay. So um, yeah. So so um, it's it's a bit of a long paper. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. It's a real pleasure uh, speaking with you. And sorry about the initial kind of hiccups on um, technological issues. Uh, but I wanted to say it's a little bit of a, a long paper uh, because uh, you know it's divided into two, and I want to give. A very quick recap of what we did the last time and just a couple of points to see basically how what I did in the introduction connects with what I'm going to do tonight and then I will um, you know just kind of uh, outline in the first part of, of the paper the second part of the paper um, the uh, foundations of um, the you know of what of what I do basically on the theories and then finally, um, give an example of um, you know some text, some poetic texts, um, um, which are part of a an autopathography in uh, diary notes and verse uh, by an English poet uh, who is called Myra Schneider. So. Um, 
so let's start from the very quick recap. Um, the uh, first part or the introductory part of uh, the lecture was um, um, delivered on the 17th of March. And um, uh, in, in that, during that uh, lecture, I gave an example of an application of a medical tool, which I developed in 2015. And the medical tool is called POS. Took me a long time to come up with the acronym and I had to fit in what it meant, but also fit what it meant with what I was studying. Uh, so POS stands for Poetry as Unifying Shared Experience. And uh, um, uh, clearly, uh, pause creates a pause in the routine encounter between medic and patient and um, uh, allows the medic and patient or the therapist and patient to connect in a different way, in a more huma uh, humane way, um, away from the uh, white coat authority uh, within the institution, for example. So pause and then unifying shared experiences. Shared experiences because I use the text, the poetic text, as a read aloud text. Um, so I developed it in 2015 and uh, I used the poetic texts which were especially written by patients that were going through um, the experience of illness and uh, were part of the literary body of narrative medicine, both for therapeutic use but also for um, narrative medicine use and educational use with varied populations. So it was tested uh, with the terminally ill. It was tested with the end of life patients in care homes. It was tested with healthy people for community building. And it was also tested um, in uh, uh, volunteer healthcare professional uh, environments, you know, um, within the hospice, for example. So in particular, uh, I explained how the tool was developed out of study in the poetic text as an instrument which is able to foster connection between people. And the central vocabulary part of the research around the therapeutic tool was highlighted as follows. So the keywords were storytelling, listening, relational, performative, reciprocal, and reflexive. So what I want to do tonight is actually offer my insights on uh, some areas of research uh, that um, uh, you know helped me basically build the uh, the tool, but at the same time uh, um, allowed me to uh, carry on with my research in the poetic text. You know, just to make it doubly clear, you know, I do not work generally in uh, um, medical humanities. I come from a school of modern languages. I work usually from the aesthetic viewpoint on poetic texts or cinema. But my research, as uh, Cecilia was saying earlier, uh, uh, actually shifted to using um, you know, these uh, tools, you know, poetry, poetic texts, and cinema, um, in order to promote well-being in populations that I was uh, studying. Also, I've been working for a number of years as a therapist as well, I was an academic. So for me, marrying therapy and academic brought me basically to, to this, to where I am now. And I find it really fascinating and extremely sort of getting more and more important, uh, especially because it's um, uh, interdisciplinary and, uh, you know, in this uh, pandemic uh, atmosphere, um, you know, academics and, uh, and health, uh, you know, so together, you know, kind of marrying the disciplines make more sense than ever, really. So um, th three points which I will cover in my next part are the poetic text as traditionally belonging to the context of orality, the poetic text as relational and performative, and then also the ill studied not as biography or labels uh, or, you know, passive compliant um, objects, but as life in the happening from the perspective of postcolonial theories. And uh, what I wanted to add here was that, um, um, you know, I'll go to the point number four, is that, you know, um, why postcolonial theories? Well, actually, you know, this actually brings me back when I was studying 
um, migration, you know, Italian migration or kind of migrants into Italy, uh, post in uh, you know post-colonial migrations into Italy, for example, um, at the beginning of the 2000s, and uh, you know because the theories that were uh, looking at the phenomenon of migration of counter-migration from the old colonies back to the mother land, um, you know, so for example, the uh, corn of Africa into Italy was, in our case, um, or, or the Indians into the UK or, or, or the Algerians into France, although I suppose France has got a slightly different story because they were imported and then sent out again when, when, when the use of them had, had been, uh, had been um, you, know, that, you know, completed. Um, when I was studying um, migration, I was actually using um, philosophies that were connected with feminist studies because there weren't there weren't enough philosophies available at the time um, which were looking at migration. Yes, we had Baba. Yes, we had Said. But you know, all the stuff that we have now that we can actually use to study migration wasn't available then. So we used to use feminist theory, and then now that we do not have, or we may have some, but I th I thought that we didn't have enough, from my viewpoint, philosophies and uh, theories to study the ill as a minority group. I thought that I could actually transfer you know, uh, again, one step further, you know, what, um, and borrow the philosophy of migrants and transfer the epistemological methods and results across to the ill people. Because after all, really in the end, if we think about it, the ill are a marginalized minority group that are often considered as a label rather than as real individual unique um, life in the making, in, in, you know, in, in existence or in the happening. And so that's why, you know, I'm trying to justify my post-colonial theories. Then in the last part of the paper, I'm going to give an example from Myra Schneider. And uh, because Myra Schneider works, uh, well, she's a British poet, she's an English poet, she's based in London, but also she's a therapist, she works with illness, she works with marginalized people. And um, uh, in 2000, she actually became sick with breast cancer. And um, she um, basically, she had to switch side of the therapist desk. She was no longer in charge of ill people. Or she was no longer the educator, but she was actually the patient in being uh, sort of um, um, uh, managed basically by other people, by medics and by other therapists. And so this dual perspective of illness, but also therapy at the same time, I thought it would, be, it would have been quite a, a useful example to show both ends of the medical encounter. So um, this paper, um, this paper challenges the presumed unidirectionality of the medical counter um, of the physician giving care to the patient as passive comply and, and compliant recipient. Described by Foucault in his 1963 essay, Naissance de la Clinique, The Birth of the Clinic, where the gaze of the medical practitioner frames the patient as the horizontally bedridden object of his knowledge, of his voice, of his agency, and of his desire, in a similar way as biography does to the life of a person. Furthermore, following the work done by Harvard poet and physician Rafael Campo, poetry will be indicated as the powerful pharmacos to enable connection with patients, education of medical students, in the hope to doff the authority of the white coat symbol of the medical authority, and instead wear humility as a habitus to meet with the body of patients who deserve to be brought back to the dignifying right to be listened to and ability to voice their own story. And as Campo powerfully expresses, um, I could prescribe, I'm sorry, I'm covering again here the, um, Here we go. Um, uh, I could prescribe any of a dozen antibiotics to cure endocarditis, 
or even a thrombolytic agent to stave off a heart attack. But what I yearned for was the elixir of poetry, which could heal the otherwise untreatable condition of my broken heart. And so um, we will look at this uh, powerful elixir, which is poetry, and see how it can be um, you know, used, utilized in the best way to uh, create connection, to create healing at all levels, spiritual and uh, hopefully physical as well. Um, so before I move on to my own research, though, um, I would like to present, and this was, uh, uh, this is really quite interesting, um, uh, a little booklet that is actually given at graduation to um, all students in uh, uh, medicine uh, in Scotland. It's actually uh, supported, it's been written by um, Dr. Leslie Morrison, Dr. John Gillis, and is supported by the uh, Medical and Dental Defence Union of Scotland. And it's actually given together with the certificate, you know, because uh, what um, uh, Morrison and Gillis say uh, that, um, you know, being uh, um, uh, it's actually been described as a friend and companion um, when you need support, comfort, or encouragement. And um, the uh, editors, uh, you know, continue saying, being a doctor is a privilege. Um, patients will share stories with you which no one else may ever have heard. The art of listening, really listening, is a very special one and one which teaches you about your patients and about yourself. In order to look after patients, we need to look after and be kind to ourselves as well. So um, the book is divided into five sections. Uh, it is divided into looking after yourself, looking after others, beginnings, being with illness and endings. It uh, shows it kind of, um, you know, showcases poetry from, uh, um, you know, a number of, um, you know, quite a number of uh, international poets, so Anglophone poets, uh, a lot of Scottish poets as well, including Valerie Gillis, who is Dr. Gillis, Gillis's wife, and um, uh, the criteria for choosing the poems, and also Raphael Campos in there. So the criteria for choosing the poems were uh, that they were short, that they were accessible, and they were speaking somehow about the experience of being a young doctor. Um, uh, the fact that they were to be read aloud or not is not really mentioned there, but I thought that some of those criteria were similar to the criteria that I chose for pause as well. And so I thought it would be quite a nice thing to show you because, you know, maybe you didn't know about it. And, um, you know, it does contain, uh, um, you know, it's a really sweet little booklet that um, can be useful for our research as well. <laughs> um, and so here it is. Uh, the themes, and uh, this is quite interesting, are compassion, tiredness, worry, longing for the outdoors. And, um, um, you know, these are the four ones that we will actually see. Um, I, I don't think I have time to go into uh, that a lot as well, uh, but a lot of this stuff is actually part of Myra Schneider's uh, poetic texts or excerpts that will, I will show to you um, later. So, um, I'm going to start with a poem by uh, Pablo Neruda, and hopefully the poem will make sense uh, as we, uh, as a carve into what uh, I'm trying to do with my research. It's actually being threaded into, like, and plotted into my paper. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so I put the English uh, translation there, and uh, I'm, I'm going to write it, read it in, in the original because I love it. And um, so, Pablo Neruda, cada uno tiene una fábula adentro que no puede leer por sí solo. Necesita alguien que con la maravilla y el encanto en los ojos la lea y se lo cuente. So um, clearly um, you can see from uh, already from the poem that there is a fabula story which is inside each of us and that in order to understand our own story we need someone else to 
find out about it, to read it, uh, to hear it uh, through eyes of wonder and magic, and then be able to recount it again, or leaving a legacy somehow, and also hearing a story and then reproducing it for others as well. So here we're already into, onto, onto stage really. And in order for this person to hear your story and be able to recount it again, obviously the story has got to be coming out uh, through spoken words rather than uh, written words. And so my paper really centers around, around this. So in 1965, I'm going to uh, go to uh, an Italian now filmmaker, essayist, novelist, uh, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. He was a poet, um, you know, he was Pierpaolo Pasolini. Um, he wrote in Observations on the Long Take, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, uh, I'm gonna summarize it quickly. Um, he writes that it is absolutely necessary to die in order for our life to make sense because while we're alive, our life is a chaos of events and possibilities. And uh, we're always in search for relations among these continuous meanings in what happens to us in our life. However, when we die, death performs a lightning quick montage of our lives. That is, it chooses our truly significant moments, which are no longer changeable and places them in a sequence, converting a present, which is infinite and stable and uncertain and thus linguistically and indescribable into a clear, stable, certain and thus linguistically describable past. It is thanks to death, he concludes, that our lives become expresses. So our life, from his viewpoint, obviously he was a filmmaker and that really made sense for him, that a life can be uh, making sense once it, it, it can be defined and, you know, cut like um, uh, a stock, you know, a, a piece of stock for a film and montage, therefore, is really important for him. Um, but, you know, by saying this, Pasolini meant to refer to death as to the final stroke and brush uh, of brush uh, that can be added to our identities to seal once and for all all the events that occurred in our life and for which we can be remembered. In his view as a filmmaker, death frames the final montage of our lives in a text. And in doing so, Pasolini adopted the genre of biography to make sense of life. What I'm going to do is I'm going to challenge all of this uh, because um, actually think that uh, biography is not exactly, um, it doesn't serve us in this case. Uh, I'm going to approach, uh, I'm going to talk about autobiography more, but I'm going to approach what uh, uh, he was trying to do uh, in a different way. And here I need to introduce two Greek words that indicate life. So the first one is bios, existence. The period means manners of existence and biological life. So basically our life from when we're born to when we die. And then the second term is zoe, which really means eternal life, spiritual life and living existence. So they're slightly different. You know, they're both um, uh, complementary in a way, you know, because we both have a period of existence, which is, you know, from when we're born to when we die, but also we have another dimension of life, which is, uh, for example, if you look at the Gospels, the word that the, 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 gospel, the evangelists use is zoe, is not bios, you know, is the spiritual life, what we mean individually as, as people. Um, and if you actually look at uh, how the church canonizes saints, for example, yes, saints cannot be canonized before the dead, because obviously they, they have to make sure that, you know, they didn't change paths right to the last moment. But, you know, um, they look at the spiritual life, they look at the Zoe, they don't look at the Dios. Okay, so the Zoe has got a slightly more... Um, um, more dimensions in its meaning than the simple lifeline um, of our life. And what I would like to do in line with existing studies on the philosophy of narration and on the phenomenology, phenomenology of the voice is to challenge the metaphysical approach that biography adopts, i.e. framing life intended as bios in a stable text that can be read, can be controlled, that can be measured, and instead the proposed narration as an instrument for, in uh, Arendt's words, revealing 
the meaning without committing um, the, um, uh, sorry, uh, revealing the meaning without committing the error of defining someone's unique life intended as Zoe, both physically and the spirituality and, and spiritually. So reading poetry through the lens of Cavarero's writings on the philosophy of narration and of voice expression offers an understanding of human identity in its corporeality and in its re relationality with others. Therefore, beyond the linguistic and ontological framing of biography and the written word, it will become clear that in the last part of this paper, Schneider's poetry case adopts different genres of writing and blurs the confines between different narrating voices and viewpoints that spatially and temporally allow for the text to merge more fluidly into a performative narrative, able to shift the ill protagonists from a status of abject object, whose ability to desire has been interrupted by illness, to having the uniqueness of their life, Zoe, recognized as worthy of being recounted and listened to as a story. And it is indeed the possibility of observing through the intimate gaze and narrating one's own story that reactivates one desire to have their story heard and their actions recognized as subversive and able to reorient political relations within the poems, hospital and home environments. So, <clears throat> So, um, yes, and with Cavarero, uh, I mean Adriana Cavarero's um, uh, philosophy of narration, which is encapsulated in the volume For More Than One Voice. Uh, Adriana Cavarero is a, a philosopher who, an Italian philosopher who actually has been working, I think now she's probably retired in Verona. Um, and, uh, you know, she worked on feminist uh, studies and she works on uh, um, philosophy of, of narration. But what we're going to do now is we're also going to quickly go into um, uh, this, the, the poetry as sounded words. And so I'm going to follow Walter uh, J. Ong's um, insights from his volume, uh, Orality and Literacy. Uh, I think it was a 1982 volume uh, when he, he, he dealt with his linguist. Um, so following his insights on orality, poetry as sounded word strongly connected to the oral nature of storytelling is the ideal narrative modality to get as close as possible to the grasping of life, seen as the unfolding of events and occurrences of the protagonists' lives as they happen. As this study deals with the analysis of voice that are directly connected to the autobiographical experience of illness via the medium of the poetic word, a literary genre that par excellence uh, adopts a symbolic language in the form of images, central attention is given to the identifying those linguistic units where images create narrative strategies of interrogation and the stabilization of the metaphysical framing of identity as a fixed and measurable text. So personal identity is studied as an, act, an, an acting performance relating, uh, related to poetry seen as storytelling, where questions of relationality to otherness emerge, as opposed to using biography as the stable ontological instrument that tries to make sense of and record human, human life as if it were a discrete and objective written text. So narrating one's story through the use of the poetic words will be construed as a political act, seen at, as the staging of one's voice, agency, and desire. And uh, um, uh, what usually, if we refer then to the ill people or even to any minority group that are usually um, under the uh, authority of others, or, you know, for example, I don't know, border authorities for migrants, um, you know, it is exactly the voice, the agency, and the desire that are lost by this group in um, when they become um, uh, sort of um, um, passive um, and compliant to vertical hierarchy in uh, either the political or um, uh, medical uh, environment and institution. It is the institutions versus the 
versus the uh, individual, okay? So the central words will be voice, agency, and desire, and the, the reacquisition of them as the subversive political act. So for this uh, purpose, in this context, I translate the spatial temporal dimension of the poetic text, sees, uh, seen as an oral, oral exchange, into an imagined theatrical stage where the very vocal action of telling a story, in this case by the medium of poetic verse, must imply the presence of an actor and a listener. We shall treat storytelling as using exactly the same rhetoric as performance via the sounded words and the rhythm of breathing stressed by line breaks. So in his uh, 1982 study, Orality and Literacy, Ong emphasized that the origins of human communication in primary oral cultures, so those cultures which were untouched by literacy, lie not in the written visual word as a sign, but in the word as an occurrence or an event. And before the invention of the alphabet, which uh, uh, dates back to about 1500 before Christ, and the written texts, mnemonic rhythmic formulas were the method to store knowledge which once acquired had to be constantly repeated or it would be lost. Fixed formulaic thought patterns were essential for wisdom and effective administration. Ancient epic narrations that have reached us through the millennia, such as the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Bible, Beowulf, or the window epic from Zaire, for example, were first handed down through the generations via repeated rhythmic narrations by bards and storytellers. These stories were repeated by the power of voices before they became transcribed into alphabetized texts. Whilst the sounded word delivered by the voice of a storyteller to a community of listeners and audience is dynamic and close to the human life world, the written word is static and fosters abstractions that disengage knowledge from the arena where human beings struggle with one another. It separates the knower from the known. So even Plato, who had excluded poets from his ideal republic uh, since their use of orality and formulas had started to be uh, by then perceived as cliched in a new society defined by literacy, even Plato condemned writing as in inhuman, thing-like, destroying memory. And in doing so, he emphasized its association with death. And yet we could even ask ourselves why Plato decided to actually uh, criticize um, written, the written word in writing. Uh, but obviously, you know, we might not have it uh, with us today. And we will see that actually in, in a way later on, I will make some final conclusions that even writing and written poetry uh, is a define in some, in some ways because it actually stores, you know, it stores uh, information for a very, very long time. And, um, uh, I suppose, unchanged as well, uh, uh, while maybe the oral tradition was, uh, you know, kind of slightly moving the meaning or changing the words uh, every time. Okay, so there are pros and cons in, bo in both. Uh, but I, what, what, you know, for the purpose of uh, my study here, what we're doing tonight is actually the sounded word that is the one that engages people and creates connection between who speaks and who listens. So although the poems we shall analyze have been fixed into written text so as to endure over time and are firstly available for consumption through the sense of sight, even in our world where oral culture has lost its original power and where our introverted minds have learned to resort to individual and silence reading and reflection, immersing oneself in sound can still be a unifying experience. Um, uh, so poetry originates from sound, the sense that wells out of our corporeal interiority and resounds back to it. And what Ong says is that sound pours into the hearer. So there's this beautiful, really kind of, uh, you know, um, you know, kind of touchable nearly image of the pouring of the sound, translating very much into the sensual pleasure of voicing thoughts to someone and receiving their vocal reaction back 
And yet poetry mostly reaches us not as audiences, but, but as readers via written texts. Furthermore, poetry originates from uh, rhythmic sound cad cadenced by the repeated formulas, which include rhymes, repetitions, alliterations, assonances, etc., but also by the rhythm of, of breath, just like acting and dancing, and as all forms of human communication. Ong reiterates that sight isolates and sound incorporates, and Merleau-Ponty in his work L'Oeil et l'Esprit, notes that vision dissects. So from Cabrera's uh, point of view, the acoustic exchange of voices um, I, I, okay, let's see, because I think I probably forgot to put this on the, uh, so from Cavarero's viewpoint, uh, the acoustic exchange of voices has the value of being more bodily than the gaze, but it is not only the corporeality of the voice that can um, uh, ground the self in the breathing and physiological body, it is the very uniqueness of the self represented by the very unique sound of its voice that according to Cavarero embodies the singularity of the speaker in relation to others. Someone's voice is therefore a unique breathing and rhythmic sound and rhythmic sound has an incantatory power. Being able to hear a sound that enchants and here we could think back of um, Ulysses in the Odyssey, you know, having to be um, chained to the mast in order to be able to hear the sound and the voice, the song of the sirens, um, uh, but not run the risk of, you know, jumping um, into, into the sea and die. Uh, so the, uh, being able to hear a sound that enchants is a similar operation to giving back sound to silenced poetry, the poetry that we have turned through habit into silent visual signs. So Pablo Neruda's lines, if we want to go back to his lines, are quoted in the epigraph here, become insightful for our reading, observing someone else's actions or gestures through an enamored, an enamored eye, an um, um, ojo enamorado, I suppose in Spanish, con la maravilla y el encanto en los ojos, must be completed by the subsequent action of being able to read and attach a significance to their story and then to recount it to oneself or to others, la lea is eloquente, so that the observed subject does not remain inscribed and caged into a platonic image, the image of the bios perceived by the observer, but becomes narratable in their unique identity and therefore zoe. Rediscovering their own identity as narratable uh, as narratable, rekindles their desiring self and allows them to become actors on the theatrical stage of life as Zoe. So Neruda chooses the genre of poetry seen from the post-colonial stance of identity as an ontological hybrid moment where the, sovereign, the sovereignty of the logos yields to that of the voice and el encanto en los ojos is completed by el encanto of the voice because it can return the fabula to the sound of life. It is through the encounter of the visual perception of someone and the fabulation of their story as life in theory that the spatialization of the subject may take, may take place. So with spatialization, I mean uh, the amplification of what is just um, uh, biographical, basically li uh, lifeline uh, into, you know, who this person is, their identity, their feelings, their thoughts, their desire, their voice, you know, and therefore a political being. So Adriana Cavarero, and this is quite interesting, the wake of Hannah Arendt's and Emmanuel Levinas assigns the voice the very source for rooting identity to its uniqueness, because unlike a face, it cannot be masked. So a face can be masked, but a voice, and here we can go straight back to Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet fall in love with each other, hearing each other's voice, because they were at a ball, you know, with their face covered by a mask. Um, so the voice becomes the resource to support an ontology of identity in its uniqueness by rerouting knowledge of the human subject to its very corporeality and the way 
from the disembodiment of the metaphysical visual approach. Uh, the sonorosphere is the stage where the embodied singularity of a speaker comes into contact with others through the power of the voice. I just wanted to add a very quick anecdote from, uh, uh, you know, from something that happened to me. Uh, I mean, I suffer from a, um, it's a cognitive, a borderline cognitive disability, which is called, is known as para, uh, prosopagnosia, which is face blindness. And, uh, you know, I find it very difficult to recognize people unless they're in context and unless they're wearing the same clothes or if someone takes their glasses off and changes their hairstyle, you know, I'm lost, I'm completely lost. So I base myself a lot on these items of clothing and I base myself a lot on the way people walk, especially on their voices. And uh, I had this uh, uh, very recent uh, kind of, um, you know, this person at a cut meeting everywhere, you know, at the cathedral in the streets and, and uh, you know, and, and I recognized the jacket and I recognized the way he was walking and the, the, you know, his height, but I didn't know who this person was. I actually knew him, not very well, but, you know, I knew him. And then finally, finally, one evening, I heard his voice and all, all the puzzle was, was pieced together. It tells you how much voice is really unique in a person. And for me, especially, so I can actually probably really connect with this kind of research as well because of my issue that, uh, you know, for me, the sight is not my main uh, way of orienting myself in the world and uh, dealing with people, it really is sound. I'm a very oral person. So um, um, I thought it really makes sense to me. I don't know if it kind of makes as much sense to you, but um, you know, for me it was um, quite powerful because I experienced it and it really kind of resolved the puzzle for me. So this stage um, uh, that we're talking about is a space of interaction created uh, whenever at least two actors actively communicate themselves to one another, bringing into being a relationship between them. It is the same space of interaction that Baba refers to as the hybrid moment of political change, referring to the transformational value that lies in the articulation or translation of elements that are neither the one nor the other, but something else besides which contests the terms and territories of both and that in the context of the study, we can reconduct to the vo vocal interaction of dialogue. So we'll actually um, deal with this uh, um, a kind of encounter between uh, the translation of elements between two different territories, territories um, um, uh, so if we think of an encounter between, uh, I don't know, um, you know, two people from two different countries, especially if the second person is a migrant, for example, um, both, both people um, have um, a desire, a political desire, an intention maybe over each other. And it is this kind of um, uh, conflict between the two of them that stops communication. As soon as we actually encounter um, in, in a third space, in what Baba refers to as the third space, which is nor here nor there, but it's a real space of um, uh, basically a connection of, um, in, you know, beyond, beyond the political desire of both parties, then we have a real dialogue, then we have a, a, an interaction, we have a kind of I'm resisting to each other and there we can we can create um, some sort of communication and um, give in, in a way as well, to each other uh, without conflict. So uh, we, uh, I refer to the third space of the uh, postcolonial theory, and the third space of the postcolonial theory in my paper is translated into the theatre stage of the vocal dialogue uh, encounter between. Um, actor and audience, or between medic and patient in this case. And um, uh, so the poetic text itself will be the stage where such an encounter can take place so that the true identity of the subject can exceed the frame of the image and leave a sign of resistance strong enough to subvert the reader's audience's political expectations 
this perspective of human identity as resistant to any limiting linguistic system or image, an identity that eludes the eye, discovers how rich and manifold the hidden can be under conditions of intimacy and how incomplete and peremptory is each moment within an artificially closed measurable unit of space and time whenever the attempt to write a history of any human being as biography. So um, there is a paradox which we must resolve though at, at this stage. Um, in this study, we're going to privilege the voice and the hearing as corporeal phenomena directly connected to the rekindling of one's desire and agency within a third space encounter uh, with the other. However, poetry, as perceived in our modern times, is not always thought as a genre for oral, oral con consumption. It is not systematically read aloud, except a specific public reading, such as poetry festivals. Like all other text-based genres, poetry in our modern times is thought of as a visual literary genre. It tends to be read silently to oneself, thus performing the inward action of folding consciousness back on, one's, on itself, of separating the individual uh, from a group or an audience. Nevertheless, poetry originates from orality, and the power of its language does not lie in the realm of uh, images, but in that of sound. So we can then perhaps make final sense of, the, of Neruda's words, con la maraviglia y el encanto en los, en los ojos, as encouraging the eye, our main sense of perception in interpreting poetry as modern literates. Whilst reading someone's fabula, as unique bodily and sound patterns, la lea, to become immersed in its and their rhythm and to let us be enchanted by its, their sound so as to regain the ability to recount that story to ourselves or to others, is eloquente, an operation which is very similar to falling in love, to unresist and give in to the other. It is not a process we can control rationally it just happens through our senses, through our phenomenological body. And then once again, if becoming immersed in someone else's voice and life, Zoe, is to enter a third space where an antagonism is no longer necessary, as under these conditions, the other loses its power to signify, to negate, to initiate its historical desire, to establish its own institutional and, oppo and oppositional discourse, then a truly political encounter and mutual change can take place. Poetry itself as a genre, but also as oral, oral, visual texts will turn in this study into a platform on which staging voice, desire, storytelling and life are possible all at once with no solution of continuity. So the power of writing as the most momentous of all human technological inventions, according to Ong, will remain part of the political transformations that poetry can perform on the human consciousness and on the elaboration of thought. The texts under analysis here, after all, are written texts for a readership. As Ong maintains, writing heightens consciousness Technology, properly interiorized, does not degrade the human life, but on the contrary, enhances it. Overall, storytelling is poetry in its restored voices and orality, but still making sense to our meditative and introverted modern consciousness as a written visual genre through eyes that can hear and ears that can see will be part of that transforming action that allows for mutual encounter to return the poetic voice to its embodiment. And finally, the incantatory rhythm of poetry, like the rhythm of the breath, may also function as a means of quietening the mind, equating immersion in poetry, both visually as well as orally, to meditation and therapy. It is this dynamic concept of poetry as sounded words and as a powerful instrument of human encounter that will allow us to open up an ontological horizon founded on the material contextual relation of embodied unique existence for our reading of Myra Schneider's unique and narratable fabula. 
So this uh, is, takes me to uh, the next part of the uh, paper. I uh, wanted to let you know very briefly who Myra Schneider is. Uh, she's, uh, still, she's still living. Um, so Myra Schneider is a well-known English poet. Um, she has been writing poems uh, since about the 1980s and uh, is also well appreciated as an educator and uh, in particular as a therapist in particular. She supports other therapists, marginalized people, including groups of, of women who suffered and have suffered from cancer. Uh, in this chapter, we are going to study her autopathography, which is called uh, Writing My Way Through Cancer. I, did, I didn't put it on the um, uh, PowerPoint, but I wanted to show it to you here. Okay, so this is um, the book, and this is Myra Schneider. I actually asked Myra if she wanted to do some reading with us tonight, but she couldn't. And so I might be able to organize a, a reading by her later on, maybe through, uh, I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it with the team, uh, you know, how it's possible to maybe incorporate her because she's a very interesting person to listen to. Um, so uh, the uh, writing my way through cancer is um, a, a diary, basically an illness diary. And uh, it functions in a journey of personal professional growth as a person, poet, art therapist, and educator. In 2000, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, um, I just wanted to uh, go a little bit quicker here. So basically, um, you know, what she wrote, the notes that she wrote, and I will show you examples of how she was writing in there, um, you know, basically led to this book, this uh, diary being uh, kind of published as a diary, but also containing all the in theory in work in progress poems that she was writing while she was reflecting, you know, so they were just notes and then they became stanzas and then they became poems. Um, and then uh, uh, actually they became a, a volume um, of its own, uh, which was published in 2005 and is called Multiplying the Moon. And uh, here is Multiplying the Moon, okay? So you see how, you know, basically from uh, a woman, uh, a poet who becomes an ill woman writing, uh, um, uh, basically an autopathography diary notes to support herself to find the strength to she basically uh, manages to carve out professional work as well in the end so there's a kind of growth uh, which is um, uh, as a woman you know the strengthening of the woman um, but also the strengthening of the therapist and the strengthening of the poet through the um experience of illness. And uh, as I strongly always believe to start from the text, I thought I would read you a little bit of text, that could maybe not read it all, but explain to you how it's uh, written. So all you see in white uh, prose are her, um, uh, basically um, uh, the diary that was written by her as she was ill. So that was written in 2000. So she, you know, I've gone through the gates today and it was the gates of hospital of the operation, of the operation room. It's been the easiest recovery I've had from an operation. The anesthetist, the young and lively woman had a delightful manner and less weak than I expected, et cetera, et cetera. Erwin here, I was supported by Erwin, that's her husband. And then obviously her friends and, um, and um, uh, the medical people. Um, all you see written in yellow is actually the authorial, the voice of the author that actually reflects between 2002 and 2003 back on what she was writing in 2000. So here we've got a much more, so here we have, have gone through the gates today. It's so set in the now, than the here and now, it's all in the present. While the yellow part, which... Um, if I show it to you in, uh, you know, I put a yellow, you know, she doesn't write yellow and other colors in the, in the, um, in the autopathography, but she uses um, bold and um, it's not very clear maybe, but you see how, you know, it's, it, it was very difficult to show on black because it's, it's, um, you know, one is normal type and the other one is um, slight, 
different, you know, and, and uh, bold. Um, so I thought I'd use colors instead, but it's very, very clear. One is in italics and the other one is um, in uh, normal print. So here um, uh, in the yellow one, so the authorial voice later on that reflects back on the events is uh, all in the past. I was amazed and triumphant that I felt strong enough to write a few words in my notebook on the same day as the operation that my fears about uh, uh, were now phantoms. And then uh, uh, I, you know, just um, all this to add it to general informality. She's talking about paperwork, etc. And so she received. And then here we go to the next one. So she starts on the 5th of February, 7th of February, um, in the middle of the night. I was aware, so this is back her in the middle of uh, her illness. I was aware of the flatness of my left breast as she went through mastectomy. I felt bereft, especially as I've had no womb since my hysterectomy in, in 1982. I found myself picturing all the Yanni women and here her images are starting to flow. Uh, and I saw myself nullified. I didn't think I'd be able to sleep, but I dropped off immediately. Poetry, please. Yesterday afternoon on Radio 4 had two poems that they requested. And so this again, part of her diary. And here, um, uh, the bath, you know, so here suddenly we have this bath that she takes. So she's helped uh, taking a bath and she, that reminds of her about a bath uh, where she had some lavender essence and of the bath that she took just a few days after her son uh, was born. Um, and so this is kind of, you know, returning to older memories and starting traveling. The bath is in italics here because the bath later on turns into a poem. So you see how all the writing is actually all kind of fluid between a, a kind of intimate, uh, authorial, uh, artistic, you know, it all becomes one. It's all part of the zoe of the spiritual life of the life and the existence of Myra Schneider, not as a nail person in bed uh, who had gone through mastectomy of, but of her real spiritual identity and life and, and the way she feels. And then uh, on the 9th of February, she's such a very courageous woman. I remember that I woke up early in the night. I gingerly touched my chest, recognized my new shape and cried. And there's a lot of these moments when she gets angry, where then she goes home and the home becomes the second clinic. She has to live between clinic and home. And she starts smashing teacups and things, you know, imagine an English woman in her 60s, I think she was maybe then, you know, smashing the beautiful porcelain teacups, you know, uh, you know, so all of these emotions come up and she lets them come up. And then later on, there's other excerpts where she talks about the cave and, you know, she she pictures herself going inside the cave and thinking from there. So there you go straight into Plato's cave and seeing the, the phantoms of, you know, so it's a very, very rich reading. And then suddenly, suddenly there's a poem that comes up and she says, so she believes in lots of technique of repetition, for example. So we go into straight into the, um, um, you know, some of the uh, techniques of poetry, which is repetition of lines. You know, if you think of Homer, it's all repetition. Um, and it's very, very ancient. It's one of the first uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of poetic uh, um, strategies. So today there is time to think about the way life opens clams parts, to save and remember rosemary's spreading purples, white pricked edges of hope. Today there is time to breathe in the silken stillness of being with myself, taking the loss of my, last, my left breast to lay my nervous palm softly as the birds wing across my left plane, allow of my left breast to lay my, oh, sorry, I copied that twice, I beg your pardon. Um, tears to fall yet rejoice that the surgeon scraped cells of death, etc., etc. So uh, this is the first uh, sort of dumping, she calls it dumping of emotions. And um, uh, later on, it will become a proper poem, uh, which I'm not gonna read because otherwise we'll be here forever. <laughs> Um, uh, so uh, the repeated line today there is time she says as an authorial voice later on a couple of years later was like a banister to lean on 
Although I knew the draft wasn't quite right, I felt sure it was a real poem. I also knew writing it, uh, uh, writing it had helped me to cope both physically and emotionally with my single breasted chest. And so keep in mind this banister to lean on because it will be mentioned again. And also keep in mind my single breasted chest because it will, um, so Bath uh, becomes a real poem in the end and that's, um, not until maybe a month later. So uh, I'm gonna read it to you. Just the first two stanzas is much longer. So Bath becomes um, kindness, an Irish lilt in her voice, spares me the effort of running the water and supports my elbow when stripped of everything but wound dressings. I take a giant step into the tub. Warm water wells into my crotch, unlocks my spine, lullabies my stomach, it is because I've passed through such extremity, this comfort is intense as the yellow witch daffodils trumpet, trumpets. And um, um, oops, sorry, I beg your pardon. And we stay here. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to um, conclude then um, with a couple of uh, pages um, on Mayra Schneider and see if we can actually tie what I said in the first part of the paper to her experience of writing as a therapist and as a male person and, uh, and a poet at the same time. So uh, just uh, uh, very quickly to say that by the 13th of February, this drafted poem, Today There Is Time, becomes a finalized poem, which was subsequently included in Multiplying the Moon, um, the collection uh, published later on. By 9th of March, Bath becomes a poem and uh, I only read you the uh, first two stanzas. And then uh, for the single-breasted, um, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, chest, um, later on, on the 16th of June, she finalizes another poem called Amazon, because by reflecting and by hearing um, um, you know, kind of uh, programs on the radio. She loves hearing the radio, you know, so she, but that really helped her a lot as well. But also looking into mythology, she found out that Amazons, which are really important in uh, English mythology, but also in uh, um, uh, Indian mythology, um, Amazons were single breasted, powerful women, which were actually strong and they were warriors and stuff like that. And so she writes, uh, um, a poem called Amazon in which, um, I would love to read it to you if we have time later, but in which she basically empowers herself, you know, hugely, um, because she rediscovers, she re herself as a mythological, um, you know, empowered woman, basically. So illness empowered her. Um, you know, throughout the experience and throughout the writing through the experience. So in our examination of, Schneid, uh, of Schneider's work, we shall seek to understand how by giving herself the courage to narrate the story of her illness in all its suffers voice fragility, the author is able to confound the limits and conditions of its own resonance by deploying more than one voice that enables her to draw some distance and perspective from her condition and reveal both to herself and to the reader hidden dimension of her identity. The two main voices are the sufferer's voice, the one that dominates the intimate diary notes at times in, in all its fragility and fears, and at other times in its empowered poet's identity and the narrator's and the therapist's voice, the one that gives the whole diary a structural and chronological coherence and is able in arrears a posteriori to add comments and the therapeutic perspective to the whole volume. We shall see that the uh, presence of more voices is, uh, is central here in establishing the performative act which Schneider, Schneider's text is able to stage in order to rekindle the subject's desire to have their story recounted and listened to. In the second section of the journal, yes, because the journal also has a second section. So the first section is made up by these parts that I showed you already. The second section is called uh, uh, writing ideas and writing techniques. And it's actually a, a, a real a proper uh, kind of manual of, you know, how to, that is based on what she did in her own diary, 
how other people that are going through illness, other therapists, other ill people, other marginalized people, you know, call it what you will, um, you know, as a group, uh, can actually use these same techniques that gave us support and solace to actually write themselves uh, through their uh, issues and problems. And um, so there's the, there's a petition, there's vis visualizations, etc. Um, so in the second section of the journal, we encounter yet one more voice, the third powerful voice of the therapist, who well in her ears of the whole experience used the poetic technique and observation she made during her illness to become useful to others as part of um, education of other therapists and even writing therapy. So I would actually say that this book is actually perfect for narrative medicine because it actually gives you all, it gives you both a perspective, including the educational one. Uh, so Maria Schneider's translation of the ill body as political is much more in line with the desire to find a balanced encounter between clinical treatment and poetry as a form of self-therapy. Schneider's autopathography adopts a different genres of writing and blurs the confine between different narrating voices and viewpoints that spatially and temporally allow for the texts to merge more fluidly into performative narratives whereby the voicing of the sick body can occur within a repoliticized space, no longer controlled by the white coated, both in the clinic and at home. Um, it is the very hybrid nature of autopathography which blurs genre, time, boundaries, uh, voice boundaries as well, that makes uh, this work of hers an ideal text for us to progress our examination of the ability of poetry written to narrate illness, to operate the changes in the relationship between medical institution and the patient. Although the term autopathography is being used, the purpose here is that of studying Schneider's diary beyond the limiting boundaries of biography by treating it as uh, an inferior act on a theatrical stage where the poet is able to use her voice in a performative manner to promote agency for herself and the legacy for the empowerment of others. Through the courageous and attentive minute taking of her illness, therapies, feelings and the disclosure of life details during a private time at home and the relationships with significant others, her son, her husband, her friends and other poets as well, she's able to transform a phase of her life as a sufferer into a space of action and self-empowerment. The narration takes the form of impromptu notes organized in a chronological manner that follow the unfolding of life and the transformation of a phase of her life of suffering into a space of action, um, uh, where we have outlining uh, episodes of illness, disease, treatment, cure, uh, also short holidays in France, a short holidays to Eastbourne, she goes as well, and at home, opening in this case, and this is really important as well, because opening the intimate space of the home into a place of micropolitics, uh, which is very in line with postmodern understanding of politics and using this action as a performative political act. And so, as I already said, the narration uh, assumes a performative dimension as it follows chronologically the events that unfolded during her illness and cure, but also as she notes, um, excuse me, but also as the notes of a diary are taken impromptu as her life happens, but always turning and focusing the center of narration and speaking persona to the present moment, the here and now, the hic at the munk at the, uh, of the speech act. This is in turn um, uh, of impact in uh, the development of a person during the real life ill condition with cancer, an illness that has the power to put her life in danger and terminate it. The performative dimension of her action is in fact able to allow the moment of life to take over and hold on to the corporal reality of her body and of her word, as well as the physical page of her personal journey and have um, the better on the uh, foreshadowed death that would frame her life into a biography. Uh, if we go quickly to... Um, uh, other philosophers, for example, again, here we're going to mention Pasolini, but if we look at Helen Sixou, um, you know, who actually really gives emphasis to storytelling 
as a center on life and female writing, uh, uh, as opposed to the logocentric patriarchal edited and completed long take of one's life as per Pasolini's statement at the beginning. Okay, so it's not just Cavarero, it's not just uh, um, uh, Schneider, um, uh, but also other philosophers really have connected, or if you think of uh, Virginia Woolf as well, for example, you know, uh, uh, female writing has always been connected more with a kind of um, uh, diary writing, you know, storytelling, uh, which are much closer to life seen as Zoe. It is, not, it is not necessary, therefore, to die to comprehend the significance of one's life. The narration of Schneider's unfolding illness and cure through diary notes um, act in a performative fashion also as life journey, able to allow her to conduct a reassessment of her identity, both as a woman, but also as a poet, and indeed to come to an epiphanic conclusion that her experience of the illness will have to be used to help other uh, sufferers, patients, um, um, through the second uh, uh, section of the book, this further use of a poetic word finds it, uh, its corporeality not only as artistic crafted poems, but also in the section of the books which develop modes of self-help through writing poetry, visualizations, and other ideas to turn poetic word into a performative speech act and agency. So the journey that Schneider performs is a journey of self-assessment, but also of reconstruction of the self after the operations and the chemo radiotherapies um, that she climbs, uh, uh, you know, through her poetry, uh, which works as a banister of words, she recovers uh, both her body, but also her self-belief as a poet, as a woman, and as a therapist. The journey, therefore, also presupposes, eases, and strengthens the maturation of the person, um, so the sufferer is, goes back to being a woman and a stronger woman, as well as the poetic voice. The poetic voice undergoes a process of maturation from the first part of the volume. Um, so the unstable diary notes turn uh, slowly into uh, stable and um, finalized poems, for example. And the professional second part of the work where the sufferer becomes the therapist and the words assume the value of therapeutic techniques. So this part boasts a voice which is more stable, mature, professional, authorial, um, uh, authorial voice, uh, uh, that is the voice that has auctoritas. The whole first part of the work is also edited, commented on by the poet after the illness has been treated as she has been discharged by the National Health Service as a hindsight voice, reassessing and commenting back on her past projection of the sufferer. There is a doubling of the voice throughout the diary, uh, as if the commentator would like to pacify the still frail other self who is part of our mother-daughter relationship with herself. And even a threefold dimension of the voice uh, through the volume, uh, which include the sufferer, the poet, the commentator, the therapist. Um, so, uh, you know, when she lulls, she's lulled in the water, in the uh, lavender bath, for example, you know, she's lulled not only by the help of the nurse that runs the water for her and by the water, but she's lulled by the uh, voice that intervenes from the future back in the past to lull herself, the frail sufferer, in the bath. Um, okay, so there is this kind of voice that cuddles the other voice in a way. So that kind of mother-daughter um, loving uh, connection through the voices between herself, her kind of um, uh, healed self and, and you know, the, suffer, the, the, the suffering self of the past. So um, I'm gonna stop here because my time is uh, probably well over <laughs> what I meant. But just to say that um, uh, not only um, the uh, maturation is in the voices, but also in the fact that, um, you know, uh, part of the um, writing of the, the unstable writing of the uh, journal becomes a fully published poetic collection, multiplying the, room, the, the moon in 2005. And it's actually, um, I think it was our fifth or sixth collection by then. So definitely, um, 
uh, reconfirming you know the successful poets that she is and here I'm gonna stop thanks for listening and um, uh, yeah that's me I can't hear. I don't. I can't hear you, C C Cecilia. Sorry about that. Oh, I just, okay. <laughs> I've got to. I've got to uh, to to un unmute. Uh, Rosellas, thank you so much for such a a wonderful, uh, expensive presentation. Um, just as we were finishing, it just actually really showed how facing death can allow for life. You know, in your <laughs> with uh, Schneider's work. Yeah. Now, I have actually many questions, <laughs> but I don't want to, um, I want to open the floor uh, to, to uh, the other participants. Uh, so, because I do have actually two or three questions uh, that I would like to ask, but I want to make this uh, the opportunity available to, to the other members of the audience uh, to ask, have you questions for uh, Rosella? Getting the ball rolling is always the, the hard part. But the first, <laughs> as I was listening to, to you, um, when it comes to narrative, like, uh, what was wonderful, I think, as well, was to see many times people think of na narrative medicine uh, and medical humanities, and they think that this is, is something about healthcare, uh, the healthcare profession. And of course, it is. But, uh, but it is also about the patient and equipping the patient or potential patients with, with voice an agency in, in the healthcare uh, relationship. Because um, we had, it, and it's funny, we had uh, the first narrative medicine group that we had in the faculty here. We had healthcare students and we had medical students. And this was really interesting because uh, the, our, our uh, humanities students hadn't realized that they also needed to have a voice for the healthcare relationship to work well. They needed to be able to express. So, and here we were talking about situations not of illness, but of simply going into a medical consultation that the doctor does not know everything. So that, you know, that voice, you know, agency and voice are, are so, so important. Now, curious as, as you were developing the, the relational and the performative and spoken, uh, spoken verse aspects of poetry, um, one of the things that I was thinking about all of the time was, um, I, uh, maybe some of you are not familiar, but in narrative medicine workshops as designed by Rita Sharon, um, there are three, uh, you can work with any art form. Uh, we can work with a literary text, with a poem, a painting, a piece of theater, but you follow three steps, which is the analysis of the work and the participants write uh, creatively in the shadow uh, from a prompt that uh, they, write, they write a short text for five minutes, which they can write in any format, um, but they write it in the shadow of the text that are the object that's been analyzed. And then they read this uh, to small groups. If it's a bigger group, we break them down into three or four participants. So they read their text to each other. And this is actually the transformational moment. Yeah. <laughs> You know, this the, when they read, because it's, it's as if they haven't understood what they've written until uh, they hear it themselves, but they also hear the reaction to it. And I thought this was so, you know, it, it really makes sense. Now, Rita Sharon says this creates affiliations, first with ourselves and then with the others in the care relation. So I'd like you, you know, would, would you like to comment on this or... Yeah, I mean, uh, um, it's really interesting because, you know, coming from a workshop where people, uh, I mean, how do, do they, do they write individually or do they? Yes, yes, okay. you write individually, individually. silently. Yeah. Yeah. So you said the workshops take about an hour in yeah. general. So you look at a text which is close read. Uh, which takes 20, 30 minutes. Uh, in a uh, there's no hierarchy in the sense that there is a facilitator. Okay. Everyone speaks about their connection to the text. 
Um, and then uh, a prompt, either uh, um, uh, the facilitator suggests a prompt and then everybody writes to that prompt individually and in silence. Yeah. And then when you read your text as well, um, you cannot, uh, you cannot, you, you only read your text. You cannot say, I was thinking of this when I wrote the text. Okay. Or, you know, you can't contextualize it. Yeah. The, the people in your small group, uh, they have to evaluate it and they use the same techniques that were used um, okay. uh, before. Yeah. yeah. Now that's really interesting because, um, um, you know, earlier on we were talking about Ong and we were talking about, uh, you know, how um, introverted we have become as modern people, you know, so it talks a lot about extroversion of the ancient people that didn't have writing and that all they were doing was done orally, you know, the, mm -hmm. so the primary, primary uh, illiterate uh, societies, there's still some, you know, where, you know, the writing doesn't exist, but obviously writing has made us become introverted, but obviously, as soon as we then kind of um, uh, express it uh, with uh, through the voice, then we, we have to become extroverted somehow. And, and, and uh, perhaps what's happening in the workshop and, uh, and how, you know, the affiliations that and the connections that, um, you know, these texts that are written in an, in an introverted way because you're there with yourself with a pen, a piece of paper and the prompt. Um, you know, as soon as it's spoken out in sound, uh, well, obviously it has to create um, uh, you know, a speaker and a listener. And, um, you know, as Cavarero says, um, you know, sound waves are, are matter, you know, they're, they're, they're real, you know, they, they kind of penetrate your eardrum and, uh, you know, you kind of, uh, and the, the uniqueness of the voice as well, you know, comes to you and you recognize, like in my case, for example, with my problem, you know, for me, it's just like mm -hmm. seeing somebody's face. So, I, I, I would think that, um, you know, it is, um, you know, what happens after the work, it, it, during the workshop, after the writing, you know, basically they're incarnating a theatre, you know, what yeah. becomes mm -hmm. is a theatre and it's the theatre is actually, uh, is supposed to create connection, you know, between who speaks and who hears and the perceptions. So if you're part of an audience at the theatre um, and uh, you hear a number of poems or you hear a play, you know, each of us will interpret it in their own way. You know, obviously there is a one plot maybe, but each moment has got a different significance for each of us according to their perception. So, so that engages you to who's speaking. And then if, the, 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 the speech act is in both directions because they'll be reading to each other in turn yes. their things and obviously it creates connection that may even, um, I don't know, what happens if these people know each other or, or you know, they don't know each other and then maybe they stay in touch and, you mm -hmm. know, because it's really very powerful, I, I would say, and that's, that's exactly what Cavarero mm -hmm. is, is talking about, is the power of um, the connection between people through um, through the extrovert expression of the voice as 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 our as a mark of our identity who we are you know so it's a bit like shaking hands with someone and meeting them you know speaking to each other and also because um, you know through whatever they write I don't know what the prompts are but probably it's quite an intimistic you know it's quite it's based on feelings it's based on your on your on your I don't know, on your dreams, on your, you know, whatever you, you're writing about, it comes from you and it's, and it's um, kind of, um, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's um, sensitive data that, uh, you know, will touch other people. Um, I don't know what the prompts are, for example, would it be like flower and then they write something oh, yeah. about flowers? Or... Well, it's, normally it's something related to the text uh, that has been, or the, the, or the film yeah. that has been watched. It's, so it's based on, it's something, yeah. it could be a, yeah. an excerpt, it could be just the three or four words yeah. from the text or... And then, yeah. Yeah. And so, and so probably the people that are writing and then talking to each other, you know, the volunteers in the workshop are probably already being connected by the text that they were exposed yes, to, yes, you yes. know, so that's already connected them. And then, you know, their personal views and feelings and interpretation of over the text the spoken to each other is going to create even further connection. And so it's, it's a very good exercise, actually, that, 
This is, his, and I see Antonio is very sad, but just one tiny, one other tiny observation. Uh, curiously, especially the younger ones, uh, yeah. young, uh, med younger medical students, they write in straight text, but when they read it, it's got a lyrical form. Okay. <laughs> not fully formed poem, poem, but it's it's curious that as you hear them read the, the text, it is not, it, about half of them will be written in a kind of a lyrical rhyming form, which is... Yeah. is that's interesting as well. And I just wonder if maybe innate within us, there is this kind of still um, necessity to, um, you know, to carve emotions and writings and, um, you know, diary notes or whatever they are in a form that can be memorized and, 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 and stored in an easy way. Um, uh, um, you said the younger ones tend to do that more than the in older particular. ones. Yeah. Well, it, it really stands out for the younger ones because yeah. they say they say I never wrote a poem. I've never written a poem in my life, you know, and uh, and and they're writing, writing in this form. And and but they're not asked to write a poem. They're no, asked no, no, to no, write no, no. a text. It's completely right. Yeah. They, they can write. Yeah. Uh, often it can be kind of philosophical yeah. text. Uh, um, uh, you know, if it's it's so it's it's not if it's it's just curious. I'm just wondering if also is anything to do with breathing, you know, because obviously rhyme and uh, you know verse is really connected, and 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 acting is very connected to dancing, whatever you know, it's very connected to breathing, and uh, so if you use your breath. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, you're, you're going to give a rhythm automatically, you know, a cadence automatically to what you read. And um, I don't know, I, I, I quite like to see these uh, things one day and, 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 and see maybe. Do you do, do over um, Zoom or at the moment? Uh, uh, well, yes, uh, yes, because it, it's funny, it works better over Zoom because we can go into breakout rooms, the small rooms, so they can have this, uh, inter this right. exchange. Which we cannot have in a in, in a, a socially a socially distanced uh, environment. Yeah. Okay. But now I have to stop talking because yeah. <laughs> I see Antonio yeah. has raised his hand. Mick has raised his hand. So yeah. uh, if you don't mind, uh, Antonio, uh, if you don't do, you, and then so we'll go Antonio first, and then Mick. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my, my my question goes in the direction of the this this topic. Because I, uh, okay, I found it very interesting when you um, emphasize uh, the the fact that poetry um, uh, by is somehow connected with orality, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and uh, and this um, would allow a kind of embodiment of uh, the narrative, which might be something more specific of uh, poetry comparing with other with other art forms uh, okay nevertheless as Cecilia said uh, um, um, the analysis of literature in the context of uh, narrative medicine also uh, might explore this dimension of orality uh, what I was thinking is um, considering that poetry um, is um, also connected with musicality mm -hmm. uh, in one way and uh, and uh, and probably um, with uh, uh, with emotions in a way that um, the literary text text uh, um, sometimes doesn't allow so much how how this use of of musicality in poetry and how the use of emotions could also serve in this embodiment that you talked about. Uh, okay, you talked about written just now in the answer to Cecilia. And okay, I, I think it goes in this direction. Um, and, also, and also with the fact that uh, by, by emphasizing musicality, poetry uh, starts probably to work in um, a multi-sensorial registry and how this could help us in exploring this uh, use of narrative in, in health humanities. In health humanities, right, okay. Uh, yeah, it's a, a complex question. I'm trying to <laughs> break it down into, right, okay. So, um, 
going back to uh, why um, I, I mean, I chose poetry as one of the main, uh, you know, kind of instruments basically to develop my, my research. Um, the musicality is really important because the, mus the musicality is very much connected to the rhythm and is connected to the fact that, um, uh, you know, to breathing is connected to, um, well, if you think that poetry used to be sung, for example, once upon a time, you know, poetry is a, um, in, in ancient times, um, and they used to be accompanied by an instrument as well, you know, so, uh, it, you know, it really goes very well. Uh, what speaks to me about poetry, um, which could connect to musicality, but could connect to, to images at the same time, you know, because it's just, um, you know, if you, so, so for, for example, if you use uh, uh, prose, a prose, apart from the fact that it's much longer, and uh, usually unless it's a short story, but a short story is always just a few pages anyway, well, a poem can be just a one page. So um, it can be read a number of times in a short time. Um, it's uh, because it's compressed, it has to be musical, but at the same time, it has to be, um, it has to be composed by images that sit next to each other without necessarily having a syntax, for example, that prose would have. You know, so you, you, you have a whole, uh, and, and in prose you're also more connected and interested maybe in the plot. You don't necessarily need to have a plot in a poem, but you've got a number of images compressed next to each other. And each of the images is so powerful and can be expanded, can be sung, can be read in various different ways. You don't read a poem always in one way, you can read it in different ways. So the musicality can change, it's not fixed the musicality, the rhythm can change um, and, and you can give it different meanings and you can interpret it individually. So each uh, reader and each listener will see and hear different things. And also, you know, so the music is also visual music. So remember before I said, you know, uh, from what Neruda was saying, eyes that can hear and ears that can see. So we can actually really fuse our senses together in a poem much more than we can do in, in a piece of prose, I would say. And, and I think that's that, really uh, powerful. Yeah. And sorry, someone said something. Sorry. I would just let, let me ask, would, would you say that poetry in this sense is more near personal experience than prose? It's more, uh, it's a difficult question. Um, it's a difficult, um, maybe a complex answer because um, I would say that a poem is closer to a painting that you can use a brush to add strokes next to each other. And you can come out with either a still nature or, or a landscape or a cubist painting, you know, depending on what, how you want to paint and what. Uh, while, you know, maybe prose is slightly different. Prose has got more regular, more rules that you need to follow to have, you know, syntactic and it has to have punctuation. Poetry doesn't need to have punctuation. So it may be closer to the expression or the outpouring of your feelings that you can actually pour on the page. And then when you read it out, you can actually pour, you know, the, the feelings uh, either from yourself if you recite it or from the text into the stage and people collect them as they, as they can. Having said that, there are also some people that find poetry ex extremely difficult, you know, because it is, it is usually known as um, impenetrable kind of genre. Some people feel that it is impenetrable. I actually don't think so, because I think it's, uh, that there's more or less even too much freedom in poetry, I would say, while prose holds you by, you know, punctuation and text and plot. 
you know, so it's more controlling of poetry, you know, and that's what I think is scary about poetry. So I would say that in my case, you know, I, mean, I did my PhD on poetry. So obviously for me, poetry is my bread and, you know, gave me a job and fed my family, <laughs> etc. cetera. But uh, it's what I've done all my life, basically. So I find poetry uh, amazing. Uh, and I particularly resonate really well with poetry, but I also find that poetry has got this extra, um, um, kind of qualities that make a stand out next to prose for therapeutic mm -hmm. reasons because of its brevity, for example, because you can read it several times, you know, and, and every time you read it, people pick something different. Or you, you don't read a short story for as short as it is, you know, you don't read it more than once or usually, you know, with a group. Yeah. But a poem can be read over yeah. and over. It's a bit like a song. You know, you can sing it several yeah. times and then, um, so I don't know if this answers what you were <laughs> trying to say, because maybe I forgot a part of your question. Uh, oh, it's okay. Um, it's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and maybe if you don't, uh, maybe we go to me, because I think we could probably have something to say about you. would raised your hand to ask a question, Mick, and... Uh, you probably have something to add to this as well. Yeah, just very, very um, simple things. Thank you for that. Uh, the, the, the first one is just clarifying a doubt. It's probably a silly doubt. I mean, presumably these, um, I'm looking at you as a sort of a native English speaker, but presumably the, these sessions are done with Portuguese people speaking Portuguese. They're, they're speaking uh, in their own language, is, are they? This is Cecilia. Yeah. I'm so sorry. This is for, this is okay. initially well, you know, initially no problem, for Cecilia. No sorry, Rosal. Excuse okay. me. Okay. No yeah. problem. Yeah. Yes. Um, it depends. You have to dominate the language. So, yeah. uh, for instance, sometimes we have mixed uh, when we're working with undergraduate students um, in the medical faculty or in nursing school. It's always in Portuguese. In um, the part part um, of the I mean that was just a sort of a silly doubt that I had. But part of the reason for that is sort of going back um, to years ago when I used to do lots of um, private lessons with students of a, of a you know, students in English students of a high standard. Um, and as I got to know, they would uh, be very forthcoming. They would talk to me. They would tell me about their family, um, their private lives. And I, I often wondered whether the, speaking in a foreign language, even mm -hmm. a language that they don't, was actually a kind of a release. It's like it's it's not real. They, they were more avant-garde. <laughs> they were more. I saw. You know, if we were speaking in Portuguese, would you really be telling me about your daughter and her relationship with her boyfriend? Because you know, I, I, I really. Don't. Um, I, so I wonder if that is a, 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 um, an issue um, or something that's worth exploring. Whether whether in, you know, whether the the foreign language mm -hmm. is a kind of a release because there's a there's a different there's a distance in some way. Maybe I don't know. I don't know. I'm throwing that out. The other one. The final one, I'm sorry, again, this is for, for um, Ro Rosella as well. I'm just wondering initially, is there, I mean, I suppose it comes down to honesty, you know, whether, how difficult is it when you put people in that position to get them, you know, whether they feel a kind of pressure that they have to produce, they, they're on stage, whether people fake it, oh, I need to produce something good, I need to produce something, is, is that, has that, I'm just wondering, has that been an issue? whether they go straight to the truth or they think, oh my goodness, I'm asked to write something, I have to present it. Oh, I better, you know, pressure, pressure, pressure. I need to, I need, I, I need to produce something that, that's, that's not necessarily the truth. I need to produce something that will impress people, that people will oh, have something yeah, yeah, to yeah. talk about. I don't know, I, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I, it's, um, I just wondered if that's, um, you know, especially yeah, yeah, just yeah. to begin with, you know, okay, you know, so I'm going to write a poem. Oh my God, it, it has to rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but you see, or, or anything. So they sort of put on an act. They perform rather than present the truth. I, I'm just, it's a, just a question as to whether whether you've come across whether anyone has come across that as an issue, and to sort of to cut through that and say, you know, don't worry about the performance. Oh well, yeah, well, tell the, me the, what. The, just tell us the truth. You know. No. Um, but, uh, yeah. Sorry if that's yeah, complicated. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, so you're talking about in the narrative medicine workshops. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and whether yeah. Rosella has had an experience where it's actually difficult. Yeah sort of people will will you know will be will feel that they are on stage and therefore some sort of performance you know i have to well this isn't very dramatic 
my story isn't really very dramatic so maybe i better you know boost it up a little bit you know <laughs> uh, or some you know do you know do you know what i mean whether whether that's a kind of uh, whether that has been an issue at all or um i don't know it's just a qu question that occurred to me so as a i mean possible... uh, i think that uh, what maybe my sessions were slightly different from what celia was um you know mentioning about her workshops that kind mm. of format um you know i've worked a lot with end of life um and uh palliative care and uh, oh, okay. i found that uh, you know okay. these people a, a lot of the people with uh, end of life uh, suffer from dementia so they they don't they don't fake it <laughs> right. they they right. might yeah. yeah they have a completely and people in palliative care um uh, that um, I've worked with uh, have come out with uh, complete honesty, you know, real, real, um, uh, you know, like old memories that they completely forgotten about. Like, for example, uh, I remember a lady, she, she was Italian and um, uh, she was, you know, she had cancer and she was um, in, in, in a hospice in the UK, you know, so, so she, I was the only person she could talk Italian to, you know, and she, she, she came out and she said, well, look, you know, they say we just done now is reminding me that my husband back in 1960 something gave me a rose. I completely forgotten about that rose, you know, and you made me remember that or something like that. So they were really, I would say that people in palliative care, people that are about to die, um, they don't care about performance, you know, they, they, they have very little left and all they want to is just um, come out with their real feelings. And in fact, when I uh, read stuff from, um, um, you know, um, poems from people uh, like um, Myra Schneider or others, they were interested because they felt that Myra Schneider understood them. You know, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. so they're very very honest with their feelings and with what and there, there was never. I didn't get them to write too much. They were more speaking, but I suppose it could be speaking on a stage rather than you know declaiming or poetry. And the only time when I was doing um, in the workshops, I made them speak. Um, no, I made them speak. We we were discussing the poem and then we were um, writing individually and then they were reading the poem out loud it was for community building and that I can't I can't assess too well because there were two or three of them that said I've been writing poems all my life and they knew exactly what they wanted to write and how and there were people that had never written poems or never didn't even have a, an idea but they came out with lovely uh, lines that sounded like poems are very felt um, very heartfelt kind of lines. So I, I think there was a mixture there. I couldn't assess it properly if, uh, you know, the people that had written poetry all their life were actually showing their best or if they were 100% honest, I don't know. Uh, but I would say end of life, palliative care, people were extremely honest and, and, and really down to earth and really interested in reading something that would make them make peace with what was going on with them at that time. But yeah. I don't know if Cecilia has a similar. Uh, it, it, there are very different circumstances, but in general, one of the things that you do is they don't have to you know, perform. They have to write, and but we, that's why they're broken into such small groups. So they're writing, to, they're reading to uh, their colleagues and maybe one is selected to, to read to the whole uh, group. So there isn't a performance, there isn't a necessity for a performance, but they actually often you find that they don't want to read, like say you're coming to the end of a session and you're going to run out of time and they want to read, you know, they want to read in their small groups. Um, and there was, oh, but you know, so, so, so I think it's an opportunity, like uh, the, the like, uh, three words that stood out to me with, with Rosella's um, uh, 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 talk was agency. Like I, I actually wrote them down here, but you had the three of them together and I thought this is really the power of the spoken word, the, the spoken word is agency. Desire and, and voice. Desire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. This, it kind of fits into this, not saying that at some stage someone doesn't, you know, but it's not an issue the way it's structured. And, Five minutes, uh, like Rita Sharon has structured this, so it's a five-minute period. It's just actually the ideal period because it's if it was shorter, they wouldn't have time. If it was longer, it would be they would be bored. So I, I think it works. 
more or less. But you know, it's incredible. We're actually nearly at eight o'clock. So we yeah. would have time for one quick final question and we will let you go. Um, has anyone got a one quick final question or time has gone so quickly you have yes yeah I, I wanted to ask um, I wanted to ask uh, Isabel if you found any connections between what you were saying in the beginning of nature uh, was it uh, nature a diary you were talking about and uh, what I'm doing at all or well, uh, not uh, certainly not a, a direct one, uh, but I think uh, that one when one comes to to think about the well-being of the other, um, and I was curious because at, at a certain moment you mentioned the longing for the outdoors. So I was expecting uh, to listen to something about it. So, um, oh, but if not, <laughs> if not directly, of course, uh, indirectly, there are some uh, relations. Um, people, uh, as you were saying, people try to, to put in a honest way um their feelings uh, about life especially if they feel they are not um if they are not well so i think um that uh, well maybe there's there's uh, um, a relation there that can be uh, fostered and that can be and that can turn out more visibly. Uh, that's it. That's it. So if not uh, a direct uh, one, certainly uh, it made uh, it uh, um, made me thought about uh, the circumstances of some of the the readings. Uh, I've been doing and what uh, the authors uh, are saying. So, yes, uh, I'll think about, uh, about your presentation, um, about your words and what about you have said, namely about poetry and uh, see if I can delve into it a bit more. Yes. Because uh, uh, apologies for, you know, I, I mentioned the outdoors and then I, I mean, there's so much I could have said about the outdoors in Maya Schneider, but, you know, we didn't have time to. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, 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 I was the, just saying that I was looking forward because I thought, well, maybe there's, it's relevant for there's you. some more yeah. direct uh, connection there. There is, there is. I mean, her first poem starts with the, uh, an outdoor, you know, she as soon as she finds out she has cancer, before she goes to the hospital, before all the cure starts, you know, um, you know, she goes for a walk, and the first thing that uh, she um, she notices is February. So, um, you know, it all starts around February between January and February, and uh, the first thing she notices is that the snowdrops have pierced through the snow in her garden, and she notices that in the park. She lives in London near a very nice, beautiful park. I've been to a house once. And uh, she's got a lovely garden. And then she says that, um, you know, and the first of the poems she writes is called Snowdrops. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I, if you want, I could read it for you and, um, you yeah, know, see, why not? And yeah, see what it says. Maybe we could conclude with a, a quick reading of a poem. Um, but, um, you know, it's interesting because the snowdrops becomes, not that I want to, give a meaning to the poem before you do. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I don't want to interpret it for you, but it becomes the beginning of her resilience because snow drops, they yeah. pierce, you know, they live in the cold, they pierce through the snow. And um, let's see if I can find it. Yes, and usually what people say, or at least the author says, is that the act of paying attention uh, paying attention to details in this case of nature or related to nature helps them to focus, to, to, 
to to how, how should I put it um, to pay attention I mean to feel themselves in the world and I think that's uh, yeah. an important uh, issue that helps people in a fragile situation uh, and in this case in a fragile health situation to to be part of the world again yeah. and it's the act of paying attention that gets yeah. the, the most of it yeah and also you know she goes for several walks and um in, and then there's this um, um imagined walk where she you know she's in the she's walking in, at night and then she goes into the cave and the cave is the place where she folds onto herself and um, and from there you know so there's this there's, there's, there's a lot really in the outside a lot of the poems contain also images of flowers you know so daffodils and um, mm -hmm. uh, lavender and she's got a poem called uh, um i think it's provence it's all about lavender and something like that. so lots of flowers um but I'll read you snowdrops, and so maybe then after we can all go and yes. <laughs> have dinner. Yes. So, yes. so snowdrops. As I stare at the small white heads, their circular bed set in a bold frontage, the afternoon swells with distress. I imagine picking, imagine pressing layers of green rimmed petals to my chest to cover the emptiness which will shout when I lose my left breast. Though they look weak beneath a, beneath a bushes crude black spread of branches, these are not drops, crystals, bells that ring thinly, not hang dog ninnies, timid girls running out of breath. They have heaved through weighty clay lumps speared freezing air to bloom without summer's prop, are more daring than can-can poppies, fiercer than swimming open-mouthed fear that wants to devour, devour me. They stand uncowed by the north wind, its sudden bluster, cruel bite, and as I move on each flower, fills me like an annunciation.